Well, hello Chicago and hello Judith and Patricia and uh, welcome to our session. This is a bit of an experiment. I'm not there, as you can see, but I am in Mongalo in southern New South Wales in Australia in early winter, if you look out the window. My paper, The Code Breaker, is about Edith Rickett, who was a Chicago pioneering academic at the turn of the century and died in the early 30s. What's the link? What makes sense? Why have I chosen her? Well, we all love a good spy story and especially a good codebreaker story. And of course, we all love linking Virginia Woolf to everything. So you can imagine the thrill I felt when this combination emerged from my research on early readings by young women scholars on Woolf. I've been working on the 1941 Australian thesis by Nuri Mass, as some of you know, the subject of my dissertation for a long time. And I've had Ruth Gruber to talk to about this. But then I discovered at the New York Public Library a thesis from 1930, done actually at the University of Chicago by a young scholar called Elizabeth McKee Eddy. I was able to purchase it. I'll talk about it further on in this paper. But the real story that emerged was who had taught her and supervised her thesis and the story of the woman behind this thesis about Virginia Woolf, Professor Edith Rickett. She's the real story. I had to work backwards to find out a lot more about her. The thing is though, the more I found out about her, the more I realised she was a woman of secrets and that in some interesting way, she links military intelligence, spying, code breaking, and modernist textual analysis, and in particular, Virginia Woolf. Her life's very interesting, and I have a photograph of her. She's an elusive woman, known about, but the more you know, the more secret she is. As a young woman, and then I have a lovely photograph of her later in her life with her partner, professional partner, neither of them married, John Manley, on their way back from Europe on a boat. Well, you know, this is a bit of a detective story and we're all scholars, we know how this works. You end up with lots of different little bits and pieces and leads. And what I had was a thesis in 1930 and um, an introduction to it in which Elizabeth McKee Eddy talks about the method she's using and that she bases it on her teacher's work and it's this book, New Methods for the Study of Literature by Edith Rickett. Now, I thought, oh, this is interesting, but you know, where's this going? Until I read the introduction in which Edith Rickett says, quite disingenuously, that she found her method for studying modernist writers and in particular um, in um, facilitating and supervising this thesis on Wolf from being a code breaker in military intelligence. Well, there you go. Uh, my interest was piqued immediately. And so I started to try and find out more about Edith Rickett. Now, the thing is that she's most widely known as a Chaucer scholar now, even though um, the work has been probably long uh, superseded. But she and John Manley are, if they're famous for anything, famous for a, m a massive eight volume study of Chaucer and medieval scholarship in general. How on earth was this connected with military intelligence? You know, basically my interest had been piqued by reading that she had learned about how to decipher modernist texts from being, well, what I thought was a spy. Well, as Judith said to me, well, a spy is different from a code breaker, Suzanne, but well, you know, let's just not argue the difference. Now, this took me to finding um, about the American Black Chamber. Now, well, that even got me more interested in the secret diplomacy that the cryptographers of the First World War uh, un unleashed upon the world, even unto this day in WikiLeaks. That's for you, Judith, also. So I was able to get a book by Captain Herbert Yardley, which was written in 19... 31 called the American Black Chamber and in that he talks about the formation of 
an organisation called MI8 and his principal educator and scholarly, the scholarly base for this was set by PhD students from the University of Chicago, basically led by John Manley, who then recruited Edith Rickett and they came to Washington and set up the Cryptographic Bureau. And basically their job was to, to um, set up ciphers to, in order to be able to read the telegrams of foreign governments. As, um, as Captain Yardley himself said, America must know who her friends were and who were her enemies. How? Except by reading the secret messages from foreign governments. Well, that's familiar today, right, with, with Julian Assange, etc. So this is the beginning of a great modernist linkage to um, the surveillance process. Now, Edith Rickert, who had a background already in philology, in German language, in Chaucerian and medieval studies, and in, in an interest in teaching and being a scholar, had also, she'd also written four novels, she'd lived in London for several years. There's a marvellous story, this ought to be a movie, I can tell you. And um, she was recruited with all these skills and her working relationship with John Manley, that's another whole story. I must tell you, this is like an octopus. I've been fighting off confusion, but it's maintained by my interest in intrigue, that um, she came to Washington with all these skills and this interest in modernism uh, as a writer and as a scholar and she set to work basically as a brilliant code breaker. Now um, there's a, an idea about a code breaker that Yardley also talks about that I think we're all, we'll all find interesting even today. He says the successful cryptographer requires a type of mind difficult to describe, including great originality and imagination of a particular type. We call it cipher brains. Well, among the thousands who worked for the cryptography unit, there were, he says, never more than a dozen who had real cipher brains. And he puts at the top of his list, John Manley and Edith Rickett. And there's no question that this ability to code break, to develop pre-computer, that's the key here, um, uh, an analysis of text was what then set Edith Rickett up on her teaching, in her teaching career and her methods that she put in this book. And that's how she encountered Elizabeth McKee Eddy. See, I hope you're all getting this. This is a detective story as well as a spy story and a cryptography story. And no wonder I'm confused with all these pieces of paper all over the table. So what we have is Edith Rickett in Washington essentially being a genius cipher-brained spy. And in fact, she and Manley, uh, but in, only in recent times is she getting more credit than she would got at the time. Um, Mind you, there were so many secrets, who knows what they were allowed to say. But she was really responsible for the arrest and uh, prosecution of one of the, the most famous of the spies of the First World War. Um, uh, Barbara Tuckman wrote about the Zimmerman telegram. Well, there was another similar story uh, about another spy and uh, called Pablo Waberski, uh, who was a German secret agent, that uh, Edith Rickett was responsible in, um, in having captured and in cracking the codes. And the codes were related to Germany trying to get Mexico to... Uh, they promised Mexico that they could have all these bits of America, like New Mexico and Arizona, sorry girls, and uh, in order to keep America out of the war. So there was all this drama in Edith Rickett's life. Now, theoretically, uh, this, the Black Chamber and MIA disbanded at the end of the war, but in fact, we know that it didn't and that it morphed from one thing to another and ultimately probably became the basis of the CIA and the NSA today hence the connection to WikiLeaks, etc. So Edith Rickett had this kind of very exciting life and then got a job with Manley back at the University of Chicago 
and then started to develop her methods of applying to modernist writers like Stein, Joyce, and of course in Virginia Woolf, what she had learned as a cryptographer. And that's where the Eddy thesis comes in. And the key thing in terms of how she taught that I think is important is that she learned as a spy and as a, well, as I know I can't give up calling her a spy, but as a cryptographer, that this work had to be done in groups, that they recruited all the PhD students they could from the University of Chicago to come to Washington and they worked in these huge groups and which, which um, what was to do the most labour intensive work because code breaking is very labour intensive. Well, so is this method that Edith Rickett developed for the study of modernists. And so I want you to now just have a bit of a look at these two co-breakers, Edith Rickett and John Manley again, as we've seen her as a young woman. And here they are coming back from Europe in the early 30s. And I think it's quite clear that the relationship with Washington probably never ended and that the secrets in Edith Rickett's life continued including there was always scandal around her and uh, about her relationship with Manley and there are other stories about her involvements with women but we won't go there today. Focusing now on the Elizabeth McKee Eddy thesis. This is her student card and her thesis uh, title is the, an analysis of the style of Mrs Virginia Woolf with special emphasis upon her thought patterns. Well, it's a most original thesis. I've done quite a few graphics about her um, and her thesis itself is filled with remarkable statistical drawings, fantastic diagrammatic sentence structures, etc. And this is clearly fueled by and driven by a very different kind of research from the, from the standard literary research of the period. It's clear that in Edith Rickett's book, which was the, the basis upon which the Eddy thesis moves, is that it was an early form of statistics and a new analysis of sentence structure. That Rickett's hypothesis was that the soul of literature is inseparable from its style. That this was pioneering research, student-driven research that she was um, advocating and she strongly emphasised the role of students in her work. So in other words, we can sort of have some idea of the experience that Elizabeth Eddy may have had as a young student um, in that she would have been part of these groups that, but she had her specific task and she carried it out. Gosh, who knows what, how hard it could have been because the, the actual analysis and the structures and the, the computation of knowledge pre-computer is awesome. She worked off uh, Mrs Dalloway, The Voyage Out, To the Lighthouse and Jacob's Room. She um, is looking for psychological conceptions, graphs, analyse the modifiers. Uh, the material is said to be shaped not to the literary form but presented as it comes from the mind. Uh, there are a large number of musing sentences, the creation of psychological realism, simplification, a technique for blocking of thought, detached constructions, etc. It's very, it gets very complicated. Mrs. Wolf gains two of her most interesting effects, the impression of a thought groping through to clarity and the impression of brooding delight in the external world. The sentence organisation has a kind of artlessness and naturalness which is underpinned by clear rhetorical devices. There are two distinct types of sentences, blocked or groping sentences used for mental states and descriptive types with deceiving parallelism in which everything has meaning. Everything matters, as Stein also said. Raw materials of the mind, the reader, has to be present as much as the writer to be a creative part of the process. All of this is very familiar material to Wolf scholars more recently, but here we have this, the, this goal to look at the sentence itself and its internal dynamism in order to voice what 
Wolf was doing in her sentence structures. And these graphs, it's quite clear why this method didn't continue. And that's one of the questions that I had to ask at the end of reading the Eddy thesis was where did this go? And of course it couldn't go anywhere because it was too labour intensive, I think. And I think the reason why only now with digital humanities and the wonderful work that scholars, young scholars like Amanda Golden are doing at Georgia Tech and other places, looking at Jacob's Room, I'm thinking that would be a very interesting comparison, is because now there are computers which can cut down on some of this work and open up this question. So what I'm wanting to say about Edith Rickett is that with her cipher brain, she got to a place of asking the kinds of questions that her techniques and tools couldn't really sustain for any length of time. This was an unsustainable intellectual practice and I think now it's possible to open up the cupboard that she built and in many ways to embrace her as a pioneer digital scholar, a pre-computer scholar, a cipher brain of, a rem of remarkable insight. When I first looked at the, this young student thesis that she supervised, I thought, this seems like some sort of nonsense. But actually, it's brilliant. And um, when I write the paper up, I'll hopefully convince you of that. Because what she's able to do is demonstrate Wolf's skill and technique in ways that I think Wolf probably, well, you know how we all ask, what would Wolf think? She might have well been horrified. But on the other hand, I think not, because this kind of innovative thinking about the structures of words was always something she embraced and, was, and welcomed. So what happened to Elizabeth McKee Eddy well, that's not been easy for me to find out. She appears to have become an anthropologist. There's just evidence of her having lived on Riverside Drive in New York and working at Hunter College later on in the 50s and ending um, in anthropology at the University of Florida. Um, I haven't been able to find much else about her. We're going to have a look one more time at the photograph that I showed you at the beginning and talk about the third person, the man on the right, whose name is David Stevens, another colleague from the University of Chicago English Department, who it now turns out also worked for MI8. But this photograph was taken in the early 30s, just not long before Edith Rickett's death. John Manley wrote to David Stevens at this point. He says, she's working 25 hours a day as usual, She's on the verge of a breakdown, but she won't break. She never does. So in conclusion, I just want to say that I think it's a very profound irony that Edith Rickard, who supervised the first academic thesis on Wolf, 1930 Chicago, very important, whose work really opened up the, the study of modernist texts informed by her involvement with military intelligence and I think that she wrote that and then died several years before Wolf had even written Three Guineas, the great pacifist essay of the period. And what an irony that we now have to find ways to pull together and be enriched by a modernist study that draws on all facets of political analysis in the age of surveillance. Thanks. Bye.